Hi guys, Liz Wheeler here. Quick story before we get into this interview. At NatCon a couple of weeks ago, I was on a panel on ESG, environmental, social, and government governance metrics. And I was on a panel with uh, three other people plus the panel chair. And I'm sitting up on the stage and I look down in, into the chairs, into the audience. I, I see familiar faces. I see you know, my executive producer. I see our marketing director. I see some friends that I know. I mean, we all know each other at NatCon, right? We all work in the same industry. A lot of students. And I also see in the back, I see Riley Moore, who's the treasurer of the state of West Virginia. And this guy is like becoming a legend in the conservative movement because he is using his position as treasurer to actually take on ESG at the governmental level. And he's doing it in a really effective way. So I see this guy sitting in the back. I don't know that he was hiding out. We had said hi to each other beforehand. Um, and I see him and I thought, oh gosh, I'm here talking about ESG as the expert. He's the one in the audience. I better up my game on this. So after, after, the, after the panel, happened after the question and answer, I was able to sit down with Riley Moore and talk to him about what exactly he's been doing in West Virginia, because he worked with the legislature in the state of West Virginia to exclude financial institutions who operate with ESG metrics from doing business with the state. And the way that he went about this, he told the story, I think you're going to find it really interesting, but he told the story about how he sent these institutions warning letters and the response that the institutions dish back at him. So I'll let him tell the full story, but I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. Hello, welcome. I'm Liz Wheeler. Welcome to the Liz Wheeler Show. We're sitting here at NatCon Free. We're having a blast at this conference. It's full of... It's it's different than a lot of other conferences. A lot of other conferences are higher energy. And I don't say this in the negative sense. They're higher energy because it's a lot of red meat speeches. You come away feeling like you have a lot of people who are also fighting for the same cause. And there's value in that. NatCon is different because there's a lot of academics and intellectuals that get together to discuss the nuances of policy that we all in general agree on. So it's an experience like no other. If you haven't had time or haven't been able to come to one of these conferences, I highly recommend that you do next year. Um, I assume NatCon 4 will be just as good as NatCon 3. This is my second one. I went to NatCon 2 and NatCon 3. And I've had the incredible opportunity to sit down with so many of these speakers, elected representatives, journalists, all these people that are here. And today is no different. With me is the treasurer of West Virginia, Riley Moore. Riley, good to see you. Liz, thanks for having me. You're somewhat of a hero in the conservative movement right now. Well, you know, I'm just... Just another red blooded American fighting for jobs and uh, opportunity in my state of West Virginia. So I'll take the hero title, but certainly don't feel like one, you know? Well, I appreciate the humility, but I want to talk about exactly what you did and exactly how you did it because you have essentially laid the groundwork for other, probably red states, if we're being honest, mm-hmm. for other red states to try to eradicate ESG from the state in general. And I'll I'll just give a quick background on ESG. I did a panel on ESG yesterday here at NatCon. ESG is a social credit score system, a metric, if you will. It stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Metrics. This is conceived by the World Economic Forum. The UN defined what some of these standards are. And it's used by the big banking firms to determine who they will give loans to, who they will do business with, how they will invest their money, not just based on, well, will we get the best return for our investors, but based on these social metrics, um, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's climate change, whether it's DEI. And it's kind of complicated. A lot of people are just becoming familiar with ESG, but it's going to have a huge, it, it is already here, but going to have an even larger impact on our nation if we don't put a stop to it. So my question to you before we even get into what you've done in your state to eradicate this is when did you first realize what a threat ESG is to the state of West Virginia and to the United States of America? Well, you know, this first came up when I was first elected into office. Now, I'd heard of ESG, but I was not aware uh, to the level it had permeated the American financial institutions here. So, I get into office and I started hearing from coal companies, gas companies that operate in the state of West Virginia that we're going to uh, lose access to capital based on the industries they're involved in. And that's really when I started to dig into this. And wow, I mean, once you really start to get into it, it's in every facet of the financial services industry. 
and our capital markets, uh, every aspect of it, every publicly traded company, rating agencies, banks, you name it, corporate boards, all of it, uh, it, it's in every aspect of it. And hearing from a first person perspective as it relates to those industries and how this was going to affect them, look, this is nothing new for us in West Virginia. We had the war on coal with Obama. Now that was trying to do uh, achieve their goals as it relates to the environment through regulatory mechanisms. This is different. It's outside of the government. Now it's also being pushed by the government, but they're doing that through this, what I've called coercive capitalism, um, which I use capitalism, uh, you know, being a little friendly here because it's really not capitalism. More of a monopoly, right? Yes, exactly. We got a corporate cartel, uh, essentially, of uh, financial oligarchs around the country uh, that control massive amounts of money to push their social and uh, policy agenda. And uh, once we started to dig into it, we here in West Virginia were under threat uh, to losing some of our critical industries. We generate hundreds of millions of dollars in what are called severance taxes, coal, gas, and oil, not to mention the income taxes and sales taxes and everything else. And not the most important point here is it's our quality of life, right? I mean, this is about human flourishing. It's trying to protect our ability to have a better, better quality of life that uh, in some parts of West Virginia, it's coal mining, uh, maybe working in the school system or working at Walmart, right? I mean, so if they take that option away from us, I mean, what are we left with really is working at Walmart and that is not living and God bless people that have to do it, but that's not right. I mean, that's not the way this country's supposed to be. And why do these people get the ability to tell us how it's going to be? Because they have all the capital, right? You got three asset managers, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, $20 trillion, that's with a T, assets under management. That's larger than the GDP of the United States in a given year. More money than anybody in the world. It, it, is, it is scary stuff. And so they control this 20, these, these three big investment firms control $20 trillion and they invest this. It's your money that they're investing, right? Mm -hmm. Either because you voluntarily invested with them or because they invest on behalf of states. Mm -hmm. And that's where what you did came in, comes into the picture. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But they invest this money not based on what they consider will bring the best return for you as their client, but based on you basically using your money to further their political goals. Well, they've come in with these new risk profiles that they're trying to articulate uh, as risk. Uh, to outcomes as it relates to uh, financial outcomes specifically. So they have environmental risk, social risk. You ask them what is social risk and they can't really define what social risk is. And it really gets to the question of how do greenhouse gas emissions affect the returns of a pension fund, right? Like how does it, it's hard for them to articulate that. Um, and the, well, you know, there's risk in the coal industry because of X, Y, and Z risk that they've created on their own. But it's, you know, look, the reality is coal, gas, and oil right now, you got coal, thermal coal at over $200 a ton, Met, uh, met metallurgical coal, which makes steel. That's the only thing in the world that makes steel over $500 a ton. I mean, four or five years ago, 35 bucks, 50 bucks, respectively. It's obviously money to be made, but it doesn't comport with what they're trying to do. Um, so it's uh, hard to understand how we've let this go on for so long. Now, I've only been in office since 2021, but we've been doing everything we can to push against not only the asset managers, but it's also the rating agencies, the banks, JP Morgan Chase and the rest of these guys that are also pushing this exact same kind of agenda and coercing capital away from them. I mean, you have to understand and your viewers have to understand this energy crisis that we're in, they created it. They created this energy crisis through coercive capitalism. So last year, ExxonMobil, BlackRock, um, is, has a seat on the board and through one of their former employees, has several other seats through Engine One, vote to reduce oil production by 20% last year and increase 20% production in green energy. They're an oil company. So here we are right now, and they've created scarcity in the market. Your electric bill is going up because coal is constrained to only a few operations now. 
but still provides a massive amount of power here in the country. But we can't mine any more coal. We, we're at capacity. We have coal companies that are booked out through 2023 in this country. They, we can't, they have created scarcity in the marketplace. They have tamped down the ability for oil and gas to be able to do, continue exploration. They've blocked pipelines. I mean, and they have this listed, like banks, for instance, as you uh, highlighted, prohibitions on lending to, say, gas line construction, thermal coal, uh, oil exploration. They've created this, and now we're living in it, and now they want us all to subsidize it. Yeah, in Australia, I just read an article earlier this week. In Australia, there's a bank that's refusing to give even individuals loans for gas-powered cars. Yes. Yeah, well, that's where we're going here in this country. ESG, in my view, eventually, we're all going to have ESG scores, individually have ESG scores. It's going to be part of our credit score. Now, the difference, though, uh, in between us and China at that point would be they only have a social credit score. We'll have an environmental one as well that tracks our carbon footprints. The um, uh, Klaus Schwab and the rest of the crew over there, World Economic Forum, have talked about this. We could track individuals' carbon footprints if we wanted to. And they do want to, right? So, Except their own, probably. (laughs) Yeah, except their own. Well, they have to fly around the world and solve all the problems, right? They offset their carbon emissions just by yakking it up at the World Economic Forum. Yeah, exactly, (laughs) yeah. Okay, so let's turn to what you've done in West Virginia. Identifying this problem and defining it for people, I think, has been a huge effort that you and many others have taken. And this is a good thing. A lot of people are familiar with ESG. We need to be familiar with ESG. Um, Defining it's the first step. The second step, is addressing it from a legislative standpoint. And this is best done on a state-by-state basis, not necessarily at the federal level. Tell me what you've done in West Virginia. Yeah, so in West Virginia, the first action that I took uh, without legislation was to drop drop BlackRock as one of our investment funds. We dropped them. We had a uh, liquidity fund that was doing about $1.5 billion of inflow outflows uh, there annually. So we dropped them, then simultaneously went to the legislature and said, I need the ability to create a restricted financial institution list. If we find companies, uh, financial institutions that are boycotting the fossil fuel industry, then we need to be able to stop doing business with them and prohibit them from bidding on contracts moving forward. As a state treasurer, like every state treasurer in the country, all of our services are uh, bid out to the private sector. We deal with uh, big banks and asset managers to do that. So that's uh, getting that legislation passed was not easy, though. I will tell you, it was not easy at all. Uh, we had op-eds getting written against me, big banks pressuring the legislature to not do this. My own party, uh, establishment Republicans telling me that I was trying to interfere in the marketplace and this was something I needed to not do. But we persevered, we pushed forward, and were eventually successful. Then two months ago, we came out with our financial uh, restricted financial institutions list. We sent out letters to six of them, and we started with the six that I was authorized to do business with or currently doing business with. Sent out six letters. We listed five, and I'll get to that because that's important. One of them we didn't list, but we ended up uh, putting BlackRock, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Uh, On the list, U.S. Bank received a letter but was not put on the list. U.S. Bank actually changed their policy and lifted their prohibition on lending to coal and natural gas pipeline construction, which is, this is how we're going to win. We have to move capital. We have to leverage capital. And we can't be afraid to use the power that the citizens of West Virginia or any other state have granted to me as their state treasure, we have to leverage that. You know, simply put, people aren't electing me just to tell them that they're getting screwed. They know that. They're electing me to do something about it. So U.S. Bank lifted the restrictions on loaning money mm-hmm. to fossil fuel industry companies based on your letter, which was based on your legislative authority to stop doing business with them if they were going to operate in that manner? Correct. Correct. That is correct. And now the other five that were listed, uh, they are now prohibited from bidding on any state contract moving forward. And if they have a contract with us, we are uh, terminating those and winding those down because they are now uh, prohibited from being able to do business with us until 
such time they want to lift their boycott of our critical industries here in the state of West Virginia, then great. Welcome you back with open arms. Till that time, sorry, we're closed for business. So essentially, look, with these folks, there's this conflict of interest. We generate money from the fossil fuel industry, and then we're going to hand it over to a bank that's trying to diminish those funds at the exact same time. So we're not going to pay for our own destruction, right? We're not going to allow them to weaponize our money against the industries and people that created it. So, I mean, that's kind of our legal reasoning around this. And now we've seen Texas has come out with their list and uh, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and um, Kentucky next year are likely coming out with their list. And this all started back in May of last year where I put together a coalition of 15 states to say enough is enough. And we sent a letter to the Biden administration and uh, to the financial institutions to say, we've had enough, we are going to do something about this. And so everyone has been taking steps to try to first internally change those contracting processes, but then also pass legislation because we had to send it to the Biden administration as well because you have uh, the uh, net zero IQ climate czar out there, uh, John Kerry uh, flying around in a Learjet trying to convince everybody to move away from the actual industries that power the country. So um, in any event, it, it's we have to collectively as states come together and push against this. We have to move capital. And this isn't the only way to do it, right? It's also reclaiming our voice and our vote on our pension boards. Uh, and you have to understand that climate change, because it's it's set in so much into the psyche of this country now that it's like this existential threat. And, you know, the sea is going to rise and uh, wash over all of our major cities. That's kind of the Trojan horse in this because you can't forget the S and the G in this. This is where we get diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, good corporate governance on their boards where we're not putting people on boards or in senior positions in corporations based on merit. It's based on uh, gender or skin color and things of that nature. I mean, this is not how this country uh, became so successful and the greatest nation on the face of the planet, right? I mean, it's whoever's work, worked hard deserves the job in terms of their qualifications, that's how we should make those decisions, right? Um, and secondarily, now we have big financial institutions that said, hey, look, we'll pay for elective abortion services if your state has outlawed them. And so they've stepped into all of these kind of political uh, arenas. And then the last thing I would mention is Morningstar, which we sent a letter to who rates all of our 529 college savings accounts. We discovered they had rolled in uh, BDS, that's a boycott, mm. divest, sanction movement against Israel into their ESG scores. So it's, oh my word. it's every liberal ideology that you have out there. And um, ethos has been, is being pushed through our capital markets now. This is, and go back to us for a second to your list. You said there were six six institutions on your restricted institution list. Six received the letter. Or six received the letter. Five were on there yep. because U.S. bank chain. Did you receive a response from? from oh yeah, they all, they all appealed. Tell me, said, tell me all about that. Yeah, so they all appealed and said we're not boycotting the fossil fuel industry, and here's why. Um, the letters all look relatively similar. Um, Shocking. <laughs> and so it was. Uh, now some of them might do business in natural gas. Some of them might do a little bit of business in oil, and but then they'll have a uh, prohibition on pipeline construction. They'll have a prohibition, almost, almost all of them have a prohibition on coal. All of them have a prohibition on lending. There's an coal. irony there, if I might interject. There's an irony on the prohibition on coal, given the fact that to construct a wind turbine, you actually need coal. Yes. To forge that yeah, well, that, that's how they're like, making they them in China. I don't understand that. Yeah, look, China's over there building 55 brand new coal-fired power plants and these guys are doing business over there. It's like no problem for coal in China, but we want to take people's jobs here in America and make everyone's energy more expensive. I mean, it, it's it's total insanity when you think about it. It is insanity. So have you had any movement from those other, from these five institutions that pushed back, that appealed? Have you had any, any movement on their enforcement of ESG? No, I mean, they, uh, they have certainly doubled down on it and are continuing down their path. But uh, I will tell you this, we did get a flood of responses from financial institutions from around the country that were not boycotting the fossil fuel industry. And we're like, hey, look, we'd love to step into this business. Uh, U.S. Bank uh, had a contract with me. It just got renewed. Uh, our ACH contract is $20 billion annually in transactions. 
And then they went on to just win a contract in South Carolina and Missouri. So look, there's room. This is a free market solution because you have to understand, I'm not a regulator in this. I'm just a U.S. Treasurer. I'm not the U.S. Treasury. I'm not the SEC. I'm a market participant. And all I'm stating is my preferences in the marketplace. That is it. Consumer choice. So if you can meet our conditions, great. We'll do business with you. If not, then you can go somewhere else. You're basically protecting the free market yes. from, a, from a monopoly that's governed by these these crony capitalists, if I can even call them that. Yeah. <laughs> How many states doing what you've done, whether it's legislatively or through through the treasurer's unilateral choice of who to who to contract with? How many states will it take to budge the uh, those other five banking yeah. institutions? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you an example: is the 15 states in our coalition that had written the letter to the Biden administration and the financial institutions of the country. It's $600 billion assets under management. And that's before Alaska and Pennsylvania started uh, also kind of moving on this. And then you're talking about a trillion dollars uh, somewhere in that ballpark. So I think that's going to start to get their attention. We all just have to continue to chip away on this. And I do think we're going to get movement. Now, will we end up perhaps at some point, maybe in some bifurcated economy? Maybe. I don't know. Um, that's not certainly our choice. That's their choice. They're the ones that have decided to be the distortion in the market. Um, we'll see how that all works out. But I think at the state level, we all have to push on this. This is something that has to happen in every state. We have to take control of our money. We have to leverage our capital and our power to be able to try to keep the free market free, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do here at the end of the day. Now, on the federal level, there are some things they can do. Um, pension funds, and I don't want to get into like pecuniary factors of pension funds and risk <laughs> and return. I was going to ask you about the nerdy stuff about pension funds. Though. Yeah. People want to know this. Yeah. They want to fully understand it. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be just like just top level talking points. Tell us how to fix this. Yeah. Well, so right now, Andy Barr, Kentucky uh, congressman there, great guy. He does have a bill right now as it relates to... Uh, Pecuniary factors. Pecuniary factors are risk in return. And so it's the maximization of uh, return as it relates to the beneficiaries of a pension plan. What he wants to do in that bill is have pecuniary factors be sole consideration in a pension plan, not any of these other ESG considerations and making that illegal to do that on a federal level. Now, that would be huge if we could get something like that, because I think it could really stop a lot of this. So let me translate that to make sure that I understand it correctly. It would, it would force banking institutions or corporate boards actually too, to only take into account pure financial returns versus any social issues? On the pension plans. So just on the retirement, on the pension plans. On the pension plans. And so we do have federal legislation that guides some of this. Um, and so it would just tighten that in where they cannot use social risk, environmental risk, some of these other considerations that they're doing as they're managing the money for these state pension plans. It's just risk and return. That's it. You can't, which are the pecuniary factors. They can't do anything outside of that. That legislation would be hugely helpful in that regard. Secondarily, every state though needs to adopt, and we are going to work on this next session, in West Virginia is a proxy voting bill. And this is reclaiming our voice and our vote of the shares that are um, part of our pension plan. So give you an example. Let's say you contract with BlackRock. And what I mean by that, you buy some of their products. So a lot of this is kind of passive investment, like a uh, index fund, for instance, right? Like S&P 500, the iShares uh, in BlackRock. When you contract with them, they retain the proxy vote. So all those little companies that are made up in that uh, index fund, they claim those, sh those, those votes, right? And so that's how it gets contracted in. Flash forward to the accumulation around the country of all that, State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock cast 25% of all votes of every publicly traded company in America right now. So they have the power to shape these boards, these corporate boards right now. And that's what's starting to drive, obviously, a lot of these changes as it relates to corporate governance and kind of woke capitalism happening, or happening throughout our um, 
our uh, corporations in America. So getting back our voice and our vote and not having um, proxy advisors such as ISS, Glass Lewis voting against our interest, uh, BlackRock voting against our interests, State Street or Vanguard, that's hugely important, reclaiming our voice. And How our would vote. you do that legislatively? Is it just a prohibition on that? Yeah. I mean, so there's a couple of bills that are floating out there. Heritage has one. Andy Puzder's been talking about it quite a bit. Um, Alec has model legislation as well. It's pretty simple. And it's that they can't vote against our interest and need to take some instruction from the pension board as it relates to that. Right now, we don't have that, uh, that agency over those votes right now. The whole, the whole thing is kind of nuts. Yeah, it's crazy. It's yeah, so yeah, crazy. I yeah. mean, I feel like we're just sitting here like nerding out about all of this stuff. The right. last thing, the last thing I ever thought I'd get really into would be investing stuff. But you have like, you have to understand that that impacts your life because the, I, I, this is the talk I gave yesterday at NatCon was that the S in ESG is the DEI, the diversity, equity, yes. and inclusion that we encounter at universities and our workplaces, certainly on corporate boards. And this is infecting our whole country when diversity, equity, and inclusion is just critical race theory. It's racism and religious persecution and discrimination and authoritarian under authoritarianism under this very neutral vanilla acronym. Um, in order to eradicate that stuff, you have to zoom out and understand that DEI is locked into our institutions by ESG yes. and that dismantling ESG, you know, follow your playbook. Exactly. And, but that's why you got to go where the money is. And as it relates to the fossil fuel industry, this is what, and trying to take that money away and pushing it into green energy, that is what's financing this. And that's how we can get to the DEI. That's how we can get to the S in ESG social, which by the way, anecdotally, the S doesn't seem to bother them when it comes to China, where they have a genocide going on uh, with the Uyghur population. No problem there with slave labor, but certainly a problem if a corporate board is not diverse enough here in the United States. So the, <laughs> the hypocrisy in it is uh, astonishing, really. And um, But that's how we get to it is through... Um, through the fossil fuel industry in trying to ensure that it remains in place because as they try to move capital to the green energy sector, which obviously they are huge investors in, uh, they will have a monopoly on that. They don't have a monopoly on the fossil fuel industry. So they're either trying to change it from the inside out, like they did with ExxonMobil, or they're going to just outright destroy it. So turn, change it inside out, turn a company into a green company, uh, oil company into a green company, or they're uh, in there for all the investments. Don't forget all the tax pay direct taxpayer payments that go to green energy companies, uh, all the tax credits for putting up solar panels and all this. I mean, you can just put up solar panels, just make money in some of these companies and just write it off. And it, people need to understand, power generated in the world, only 3% of it, 3% comes from wind and solar. That's it. So why is it 97% of the conversation? That doesn't make any sense, right? So everyone has you know, been writing Cole's obituary for decades. In 1980, 40% of the world's power came from coal. Today, it's 40%. It is the exact same number. The world wants cheap, reliable, and abundant energy. And coal can answer that. So can natural gas, so can oil. Nuclear is another option that's out there as well. This, re this renewable energy thing, it's a hoax. It's not real. It's not, if you, if you don't think this is fake, go look what's happening to Germany who moved 35% of their energy uh, generation to green energy. Utility bills went up by 35%. Uh, and now that Russia's cutting off the gas and all the issues that they're having over there as it relates to the war in Ukraine, you're going to see 8X, 9X utility bills going up because this is, it's inconsistent energy and intermittent at best. And not to mention, you can't stockpile it, you can't store it, you can't trade it. I mean, this is going to be one of the biggest self-inflicted wounds in the history of Western civilization if we don't do something to stop it. And the only people that are going to emerge victorious are going to be the elitists who have seized control through mm -hmm. ESG, who have profited off of the green energy scam and who have reduced the population of our country and the world to basically pre-industrial revolution times. Yeah, well, and you raise a good point. What 
you have to look at their perspective as it relates to green energy. And admittedly, they know this, that green energy can't support the amount of people that we have right now, which is why they're in this trying to diminish human impact on the globe, which means we need less humans. Like a Malthusian yeah. death call, yeah. really. <laughs> yeah, on the globe, that's part of it, right? I mean, it's human impact and trying to limit human impact, which means we need less humans to be able to do that. And we've heard it on the World Economic Forum where they you know, touted this idea of diminishing the human population here on the globe. And that's a way they can achieve these goals as it relates to green energy uh, being able to sustain us. But you know who's not doing that? China. They're building coal-fired power plants. Seems like maybe they understand something we don't hear. Maybe there's some uh, you know, power to become the uh, hegemonic power in the world. Uh, perhaps uh, our people here don't seem to understand that. They seem to get it. Um, it seems like the American people, at least half the country, the conservative half, are really starting to grasp that. And we're so fortunate for your leadership in West Virginia. It, it was fascinating sitting here and uh, hearing about everything that you did, how you can dismantle ESG. We can do this. It's very encouraging to hear. Riley Moore, treasurer of West Virginia, thank you for sitting down with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Liz Wheeler. Uh, thanks for watching The Liz Wheeler Show. already give this video a thumbs up hit the subscribe button below and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video